sexual assault in the military, and if you've been seeing the news in the last couple of days, you know where I'm going with this. It has reached the national spotlight, and, and yet another service member in charge of helping sexual harassment victims. Unbelievably, Andrew, as we see the unbelievable data that comes out about how frequent this is happening, assaults of our own men and women in the military, sexual assaults by other members of our own military, on top of that, we've now got the second person in charge of making sure policies are followed and protecting the victims that has now done something that you couldn't make up if you tried. And, and this topic certainly cut through what we're used to seeing on Capitol Hill as it was a day of angry words and powerful emotions on the Hill and at the White House, all stemming from those sex abuse scandals in the military. I am a rape survivor. Today, the impact of the crisis of the military sexual abuse scandal in the victim's own words. I am a veteran and a survivor of rape and harassment in the military. Within my first six months of service, I was raped at a graduation party. The tearful testimonials on Capitol Hill came just before President Obama met with his top defense officials at the White House, a meeting he called out of frustration with the escalating crisis. The issue has taken on new urgency as a bipartisan group of lawmakers introduced a bill that would take prosecution of sexual assaults in the armed forces out of the chain of command. That would prevent superior officers from handling the cases of their subordinates or dismissing them altogether. When any single victim of sexual assault is forced to salute her attacker, clearly our system is broken. It's a point the rape survivors made over and over again. The system is rigged against the victims. Twice in recent days, service members in charge of helping victims of sexual harassment have themselves been accused of criminally inappropriate behavior. We are not unpatriotic for bringing this to light. The military betrayed us. At least one survivor today saying she was crying tears of hope. Hope that justice for military sex assault victims will finally start to change. Rich. All right, Andrew, thank you. Now, earlier today, I spoke with Paula Kaufman, retired Navy lieutenant and a helicopter pilot. She's also on the advisory board um, for Protect Our Defenders, a group speaking di directly about this issue. And she herself, a victim of sexual assault, played a key role as a whistleblower during one of the largest military sexual assault scandals in U.S. history, the tailhook scandal you may remember from 91. And she joined us by Skype from Jacksonville, Florida. Paul, one of the things I heard proposed uh, today was right now military justice lets the commander, in effect, uh, be the judge and jury on this. No matter what happens throughout the justice system, uh, the commander can decide to either lessen the punishment or even um, throw it out altogether. The idea is take that person out of the equation and treat this for what it is, a potential crime. I got to imagine you think that's a good first step. I, that's correct. Um, you know, I think you brought up the, the comments when I brought my complaint face to face to my boss and said that I had been attacked in the hallway. And his comment was, that's what you get when you go down the hallway full of drunk aviators. So if that is his bias, if that is his stance on my predicament, I'm not going to get justice. And that remains intact today where every victim of sexual assault has to confront either their boss, who may have been the perpetrator, or they have to work their way up the chain of command until they do find somebody who will support them. And in my case, I had um, a, a special set of circumstances where I actually wrote a letter directly to the uh, admiral in charge of naval aviation. So. That's the only reason I was ever even, and, and then of course the media got a hold of it, and it was it only until the media got a hold of my case that it came to um, the leadership decided to actually take some kind of steps towards adjudication. But it's just it's just so rare that a commanding officer has the skills to investigate. He has the real unbiased ability to be jury and judge in a case where he's got a traitor and a victim that both work for him. I mean, it, it, it's just completely flawed. And it doesn't have to be. Um, so few come forward, and as you said, you literally could have both the traitor, a rapist, and a victim in the same unit here, and the victim's so afraid to come forward. 
but put a human face on it. Talk about what that victim has to live with on a daily basis and long term. It literally drove you out of the service. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about, people talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, talk about this permanent scar that these people live with. Well, in my case, and I think in most victims' cases, what is foundational to um, us joining the military is um, a family history of serving our country. And I take it very seriously, and I think most members that join the military do understand what they, what they hope to accomplish by serving their country. And altruistic as it is, I believe that by me joining the military, I was joining a family that would support me, and we, and I trusted that that um, my command and my commanding officer would care about me in the way that I care for people who work for me. It's just supposed to be that way when you have a role of leadership. You're dealing with the human element, and there, there has to be uh, some authentic concern. So. When that betrayal was revealed, that my boss really didn't care, and that most of the military leadership really didn't care, it rocks you foundationally. And it is, um, you know, just being beyond the philosophical aspects of that betrayal, you go into a command structure day to day, possibly working right hand in hand with a person who assaulted you. or you are removed from, in my case, I, I lost my job. I got moved away and tucked away into a desk in the far reaches of Washington, D.C., so that no one would see me again. And that was only until they could figure out how to ship me off to Italy, which I didn't go because I knew I'd kill myself. And that's actually, you know, more common than anybody would like to hear. When someone is so foundationally committed to serving their country and their country cannot support them, and makes the choice to support a perpetrator of a crime, it's too difficult to reconcile. So if you could imagine a very young person, 19 years old, goes into basic training with this sincere idea of serving their country and then is raped by someone they consider their leader or their, their instructor. It's so broken, that person really has no recourse. And that is why I stay active. Because if there's a predator out there and it's just destroying the young people and their spirit to come in and serve, you know, we have a huge problem. And um, that young person may not ever recover. And you talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. Every single day that I stayed in the Navy after my assault, I got more and more desperate. And... I can only imagine what a young person who's far away from home for the first time, how they could possibly survive. And a lot of them don't. What happens is they're, um, they eventually seek medical attention, and quite often they're giving a um, personality disorder label and removed from service. And, and then they don't even have any veterans administration or veterans benefits for mental health care. It's just a downward spiral. And it's not about, it, it's not about one individual case needs to be taken care of so that that person feels safe and can serve their country. It's an undercurrent of almost like a toxic algae bloom in the military that is being ignored. And I, I just feel like it, it's degrading our military you know, structurally, in every way. And, and the young people that are coming in, they're just not interested in serving. And I would never let any of my children serve if I thought there was a one in three chance they're going to be sexually assaulted. You know, you have, since uh, what you had to endure in, in 91, you have been very involved in this issue, uh, and you've been close to people both uh, that served and still are active. And, and I'm curious, when we go through the numbers, a jaws drop for those of us who haven't worn a uniform, when you hear uh, basically uh, of the estimated sexual assaults here, 26,000, only 3,000 are reported and only 300 prosecuted. Um, the numbers going even further as to how many each day, 500 men and women each week are reported to have been assaulted. Um, does it happen in this volume because 
of the culture that maybe some of the people have gone through or the idea that there's a permissiveness from above that, hey, it, it, it comes with the territory? Well, I think that if you spoke to any of the victims of this um, epidemic of sexual assault, you would, you would probably hear a reoccurring theme. Uh, they first were hesitant or didn't report the crime because they were afraid of retaliation. And then, most importantly, there's really no uh, sense of an authentic desire to remove criminals from our military. So most victims would probably say they just never believed anything would happen to the perpetrator. And they're right. I mean, the numbers you just read support that the military has really not been interested in removing the criminal element in the cases of sexual assault or rape. They've been more interested in um, creating training programs and um, focusing on how it, it, it affects their reporting, not really how it's affecting their readiness or their mission accomplishment or the professional development of those people in the armed services. All right. And uh, when we uh, finished the interview, um, our guest made mention that we've heard the talk before and forget about uh, what Washington does or doesn't do. Focus on the Defense Department, the DOD. What will they do with policy changes or not? We're going to follow that as well in this program, and we expect to be uh, talking soon to Senator Gillibrand, who's one of the key lawmakers pushing this through. Okay, when we come back, we're going to have the creepy details of the Vito Lopez scandal and the cover-up. That and other political headlines coming up. If you don't know what uh, this... Uh, uh, lawmaker allegedly did. Uh, you're going to want to wash your hands after you hear it. Stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs>